Hey, what's going on everyone? This is Sean from All Things EV and I have a familiar face here that you might recognize if you follow the electric vehicle and battery industry. This is Professor Jeff Don. Thank you so much for taking some time to, uh, I was going to say sit, but uh, chat a little bit about everything that's going on here in Halifax. And um, we're here for a special event, right? Yeah. We're here with uh, Ravi, who's trying to set the world distance record for 24 hours distance traveled on an electric assist bike. You might see him yeah. zipping around <laughs> behind us right. from time to time. <laughs> and he's something like uh, 70 laps in already out of 1,800 laps that he needs to go. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so you, you two actually got connected because Ravi, who you've, if, if you follow my channel, you've watched an interview between him and I. Uh, you two got connected at what point? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was three years ago at a conference in mm -hmm. Florida. It was the international seminar on lithium batteries and Ravi came up to me and introduced himself and said he's a graduate student looking to do postdoctoral research one day in, in my laboratory and I thought you know let's learn more about this guy yeah. and over time I really learned about his his academic uh, capabilities which are very strong mm -hmm. but also his passion for e-mobility and e-bikes this is just off the chart yep absolutely yeah. uh, so, so you run a research facility Jeff, Jeff Don Research Group? Well, I don't know if it has any real title. It's just a yeah. laboratory, <laughs> laboratory in Dalhousie University, and our focus is on lithium-ion battery research. And you've been doing this research for how long? Quite, quite a while. Well, I started working in lithium batteries in 1978 when I was a graduate <laughs> student, and that morphed into lithium-ion somewhere around 87, and I've been in the, in the space ever since. How has, uh, how has the industry, the, the lithium ion battery industry changed over those decades? Well, it's gone from, you know, little, little cells in a research space to massive installations of, of uh, energy storage, megawatt hour scale and electric vehicles. It's gone from nothing to amazing in that time period. And um, as, as well, I mean, we, we've seen lithium batteries in computers uh, but now it seems like that's sort of fanning out to other, other things like different forms of transportation, correct? Oh yeah, electric bikes, electric vehicles, electric trucks are on the way. Actually, I was in China recently and I saw electric dump trucks, you know, so it's, it's going everywhere. Electric lawn mowers, right? It's, it's just everywhere. Um, I'm going to actually refer to some questions here because um, I want to make sure that, that I get it get it appropriate here. Yeah. Uh, the, the Columba efficiency, why is that important? What, what is it and why is it important? Okay, so Coulombic efficiency is really a measure that tells you how perfect the lithium-ion battery is. So Coulombic efficiency measures the difference between the amount of charge a battery stores and the amount it delivers back. So you would like the Coulombic efficiency to be exactly one, 1. 1.00000. So, you know, a, a battery like that in your phone might have a Coulombic efficiency under standard test conditions that we use of about 0.998. That's pretty close to one. But a phone battery might last four or five years. If you want a battery in an EV to last, you know, 20 years, or in an e-bike, the Coulombic efficiency has to be better, better than 0.998, more like 0.9995 or so in our testing conditions. It's, it's pretty, pretty incredible and, and extremely specific. Yeah, you know, I, I tell people many times, imagine your kid came home with a science test and the score was 99.8%, you'd be pretty thrilled. And if it was 99.95%, you'd say, well, who cares? <laughs> But for a lithium-ion battery, it makes all the difference. You just, know, you, just in that little bit of difference between close to perfection and even closer to perfection. Is it, is it possible that it gets higher than one at, at some point, or is there a new measurement? No, it can't be higher than one. Uh, one, is, one is perfect, okay? So it's just, that's as best you can yep. possibly do. Yep, yeah. and, and, and your research facility is, is striving towards as close to one as possible. That's right. We are making changes to electro materials, electrolytes, and our whole focus is to, you know, improve lifetime. 
And monitoring coulombic efficiency is sort of an advanced indicator of your research success or failure. The electrolyte additive like uh, uh, vinylene carbonate, um, what is the impact that that has in, in the battery cells? Mm -hmm. So vinylene carbonate is an actually a very, very effective electrolyte additive. And it's used in, in lithium ion cells for sure. So what does it do? Well, during the very first charge of the lithium ion cell, which is done in the manufacturing plant, it's called the formation step. The vinylene carbonate reacts at the surface of the graphite negative electrode with lithium atoms and creates a, a passivating film on the graphite that's incredibly robust. It's made of a polymeric material called oligo VC and other things, and it it can dramatically improve lifetime of cells. If you just compare a cell without vinylene carbonate to a cell with vinylene carbonate, it's probably a tenfold increase in lifetime. It's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. There's a, there's a lot of talk about new uh, lithium ion technology, or, or I should say new battery technology. I've, I've heard graphene thrown around in solid state. Um, a, a lot of things that sort of catch the, the headlines in the news how important, it is, how important is it that, that testing is done on these things to make sure that you're getting the right output in the safest manner? Well, you forgot nano too, right? Oh yeah, so, yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's also in there. Yep. <laughs> you know, all these things are, are um, you know, heavily researched by the community and um, some of them hold promise and maybe, maybe some of them hold less promise. And it's pretty easy to publish an academic paper where you, where you claim you've solved the world's problems, but until you put it in a prototype and really demonstrate it's a manufacturable item and it's a, you know, economically viable, you really, you really can't jump up and down too much. Yeah, I mean, uh, a few things come to mind. Scalability, can you mass produce it? Can you mass produce it in a low enough cost and then one of the things that, that we, we talked about last night was the safety of it. Mm -hmm. Is it safe to put in whatever it's going to be, electric vehicles or bicycles? You don't want things combusting spontaneously. It's a bad thing. No, that's for sure. Um, again, it comes down to building a prototype that replicates what a manufactured product would look like and running it through all the longevity, safety testing, and so on. And before, you have it, before you've done that, you're really talking about potential promise, but you just can't be sure. A, lo a lot of people have talked about um, this, this magical uh, $100 per kilowatt hour at the cell level. Um, obviously, this is a, the, the lowering the cost of, of cells is paramount to getting more affordable electric vehicles in particular. Um, you any guesses on where that, that number comes from other than maybe just one person saying it or a few people saying it? Is, is there some reasoning behind that? Well, imagine you had $100 a kilowatt hour um, and you needed 50 kilowatt hours in a vehicle pack. That's $5,000. So a $5,000 at the cell level might translate to, I don't know, $7,500 for the pack. So that comes to a point where you say, you know, that's not so bad for my electric vehicle, 7,500 for the pack. And if that thing lasts me 20 years, you know, that's decent because I'm never changing oil. I'm never doing any maintenance on it at all. It just sits under the car and it charges effectively. It's about one sixth of the running cost of gasoline for electricity. Like it's, it's tough to beat that. So $100 a kilowatt hour, I think is a sort of crossover point where mass adoption of EVs is, is going to be, um, you know, make a lot of sense. And I've seen projections from a guy called Christoph Pilot. He's a real good forecaster. Or he's showing you going down below $100 a kilowatt hour just in a couple of years. So we're virtually there. And it's really incredible. There, there are several moving parts to lowering the cost of, of batteries. I think regardless, it, it needs to happen if more vehicles are on the road, as you said. Um, what are some of those things that come to mind that will help reduce the cost of, of the cells in the cell production? Yeah, well, there's, of course, economies of scale, which, will, which are being practiced all around the world now in the larger lithium-ion factories and the vehicle makers. 
But in, in addition, when you look at the materials that are used in the cells, um, one thing that you can point to is, is the use of cobalt in the positive electrode materials. And, you know, eliminating cobalt gives you a chance to drive the cost down. Uh, my, my research group just published recently a paper titled, Is Cobalt Needed in Nickel-Rich Materials for Lithium-Ion Batteries? And, and that paper has, you know, gathered quite a lot of attention. And I think people are looking at that and saying, yeah, you know, maybe we can remove the cobalt. And recently a company called s -Volt from China has announced electric vehicle with cobalt-free batteries coming out, right? So it's, it's pretty cool. Does that, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a, um, a, a social impact and an environmental impact or benefit, I would say, to removing cobalt. Why, why are people, why is it so important to remove the, the, the cobalt from, from batteries in the chemistry? Yeah, well, the first, the first reason is it contributes to cost because it's at least double the price of the nickel. So removing cobalt is helpful. And then a lot of cobalt is mined in conditions that aren't really that wonderful. So eliminating cobalt is, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. We we've we've we're getting close to seeing 400 mile range batteries. Um, wh where's the ceiling for that? Is is the sky the limit in terms of how much range range you can get out of a out of a cell or, or a battery pack? So you know, uh, market leader is just under 400 miles right now for a single charge. Does that get to 500 at some point in the future? You know, it may get to 500, but. I look at it and say, how often do you go 400 miles in a day, right? Like you right. really need to drag this, first of all, heavy and second of all, expensive, large battery, you know, when you might use it, use that kind of mileage one time a year. Like why not put a 200 mile pack that's less expensive that meets your needs virtually all the time? I think that's my mindset, you know, is don't, don't oversize the pack um, and, or have a, have, have a pack and, and use it, use it wisely. Yeah. Um, when I, I got some, some questions from some of the people who, who follow my channel and they were actually extremely curious to get your opinion on, um, on com commercial. They were actually, they were actually really 100 laps. 100 yes. laps awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were really curious to get your opinion on on uh, like commercial air and batteries. Is it possible to uh, get a battery that's that's energy dense enough and light enough to be able to do commercial air travel? Well, there's a lot of people working on commercial air. I don't remember the names of the companies, but I, there's a company in Norway that's talking about short haul passenger aircraft with you know about a 600 kilometer range so basically an hour duration and i think in those planes the battery is 65 percent of the weight of the plane okay so you can imagine if you wanted to go transatlantic the battery would have to be massive you know like 1000 percent the weight of the plane which is of course impossible mm -hmm. so i think for the, the real issue is energy density you know and, and a battery for an electric vehicle that's going to travel you uh, 400 miles, it's going to be 500 kilograms, and a gas tank that would do the same thing in a in a compact car is a, is 50 kilograms. So it's a factor of 10, right? Yeah. And that's that's difficult to deal with. Last question, I think. So from 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 what I've seen, um, driving down the cost of batteries from an automotive maker's perspective, um, it appears like they're sort of held at the mercy of whoever's producing the batteries. In most cases, automakers are relying on third parties like LG Chem, Panasonic, etc. To, um, to produce those cells. How important would you say it is to, uh, for an automaker to consider producing their own battery cells if they want more control over cost? I think it's important if they want more control over costs. I think a really good example is BYD in China. BYD is one of the largest lithium ion battery makers in the world, and they're also an EV maker. So they they're doing everything from the cell production to the pack pack manufacturing to the vehicle manufacturing, you know, and they're 
very successful. Are they are they also sourcing their their own raw materials? Do you have any insight into that? No, I don't know where the raw materials are coming from. But you know, in China, there's such a huge yeah. network of suppliers, mm -hmm. and everybody's competing hard against each other. The you know, prices are coming down really rapidly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Professor Jeff Don, thank you so much for taking some time to chat. Um, lots of success in in the future as you continue that that battery research that we all benefit from. So thank you. You're very welcome and good best of luck. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sean, All Things EV signing off. See you in the next video.